stood in spirit beneath the cross at Calvary, where the Son of God shed his blood for you. And if you've realized the fearful price that Christ paid to free you, you'll be happy to share with him everything you have. In the Old Testament, believers gave 10%. Should not we in the New Testament readily give to Christ 20%, 30%, everything that we have if necessary? I've seen tithing work in our great radio campaign, in letters that have come in to me from 72 different countries. I've tried voluntary tithing myself. It works. I know that the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. I know, not only in my business experience, but in my personal life, that it pays to give to the Lord a portion of that which belongs to Him. As a matter of fact, of hardwood dimensions, the Lord has been our biggest asset. And a major portion of the profits of our concern are used in the Lord's service. Take it from me. I know it pays to tithe. I have ample proof that if you give a goodly tithe, you will have a goodly tithe to give. Still, I don't consider that a sufficient reason for tithing. My personal reason is the satisfaction I get out of having ready money available whenever I recognize the need for tithing funds and the satisfaction that comes with having a definite plan for giving as well as acquiring. The noblest act of a human being is to give of himself or of his possessions to his brother in need. Self-sacrifice shows the origin, nature, and eternal destiny of man. The Son of God uttered these words, Give, and it shall be given to you. For with the same measure that you shall give, it shall be measured to you again. Next to my gratitude to God for the salvation that I have through Jesus Christ, I thank him most for helping me to see my responsibility as one of his stewards. I've been tithing my personal income for many years. God has blessed me financially, but the spiritual blessing, the joy that comes from feeling that I have a part in his enterprises and that I'm in his will on this important matter is far more important. We tithe our corporation income too, and God has honored that. I've tried God's plan. I can say to you from practical experience, it works. I commend it to you. The way I see this giving business, the law of the tithe is almost as old as creation. I don't have much trouble with tithing like some folks do because I've taken from my motto, not how much of my money shall I give to God, but how much of God's money shall I keep for myself. God has done such wonderful things for me and my business has been such a miracle that I just give God the credit and try to give him the honor. I believe that tithing should be only the beginning of a Christian's responsibility. The right word, in my opinion, to use is stewardship. Stewardship of everything we have to give. Ever since that day long ago when man was inspired to plant the first grain of wheat and began the cultivation of the soil, wheat has been man's staff of life in his journey on up through the centuries. The biblical wheat demonstration begun by Perry Hayden in Michigan back in 1940 has impressed all thinking Americans. This demonstration has shown the capacity of the good earth to meet man's needs and produce the Lord's type. If man will only help himself by planning, by planting, and by prayer. Today, Americans are giving their tithes and more toward feeding hungry people as our grain is going to every corner of the earth. If it is God's will and purpose that this great country of ours is to help him answer the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, then we should be humbly grateful for this privilege that is ours. Inspired by a sermon in his local Quaker church, Harry Hayden, a flour miller of Tecumseh, Michigan, set out to demonstrate the biblical truth of tithing. Hayden started with a cubic inch of wheat, which he planted in a tiny plot four feet by eight feet. A year later, he harvested the crop, paid 10% tithe to his church, and replanted the balance. 
He repeated this for six years. The final harvest required 2,666 acres and amounted to 72,150 bushels of dynamic kernels of wheat. It required the land of 276 farmers, representing 30 different faiths and creeds. If continued for 10 years, it would cover the entire United States, and in 13 years, it would cover the whole globe. The most spectacular religious story of our generation, a great dramatic living proof of an old biblical lesson, was born in the little American town of Tecumseh, Michigan. Harry Hayden came from one of Tecumseh's oldest families. Reared in a Christian home, he had a strong faith in God, a happy disposition, and a dynamic personality. Perry represents the third generation of Haydens to operate the family mill, founded in 1835. In 1936, when the mill was on the verge of bankruptcy, Perry consistently paid his tithe. The mill was saved. Sunday morning, Perry and his family attend meeting in their little Quaker church as usual. Clifton Robinson, a student of Cleveland Bible College, preached that morning from the text John 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. These words of the Lord a word that we should find today as a pattern for our living. We have our lives and we can make of them what we please. We can take these lives if we will and use them against Jesus Christ or we can take them and follow his perfect pattern and lead on to certain definite victory through the power of his own eternal word. When Perry came out of the church, he made the remarkable statement, I am going to take God at his word. It was wheat planting time in Michigan, and Perry decided to plant a cubic inch of wheat and see how much was much fruit. Edgar Clark, Henry Ford's farm manager, offered land near the old Hayden Mill, which was restored by Mr. Ford. Students from the Ford School hastily spaded a tiny plot. And there, the great demonstration was born which was destined to go around the world. Enthusiasm ran high. Since there were 12 tribes of Israel and later 12 apostles, why not 12 rows of wheat? They were marked off with a rake handle. This cubic inch measure, holding 360 kernels, was then planted by 12 boys. Little did Perry dream of the huge problems ahead. A fence was built around the world's smallest wheat field for protection. Anxious eyes watched the little plot through the cold winter and the warm spring. In July, the wheat was ripe. The fence was removed. Perry cut the wheat with an ancient sickle, similar to the one used in the fields of Boaz in Bible days. His family and a few friends were there to help with the first harvest. The verse of scripture had literally been fulfilled. There was much fruit. Twelve persons hold the wheat cut from the twelve rows. The wheat is gathered into one small shock. The ripe heads are cut off with scissors. They were placed in a cotton flour sack and threshed with a carpet beater. Lung power blew away the chaff. Ella Escombe, the pastor's wife, holds the precious dynamic kernels. The yield is 50 times the seed. It was very religious wheat. Pastor Escombe ate it for breakfast the next morning, so we can truthfully say it entered the ministry immediately. <laughs> Professor House and 45 students from the Edison Institute 
and the Tecumseh schools are excused from classes to plant the second crop. 16,200 dynamic kernels are used in this field, which is 45 times larger than the first one. July 4th, the second year, 200 interested townspeople and passersby gather to watch the harvest. Pastor Escombe reads from the Bible and Reverend Murdoch led in prayer. Fourteen pioneers volunteer to cut the wheat by cradle. They pause for a picture before showing their old-time skill. Ninety-two-year-old Harmon Russ of Adrian, Michigan, shows how he cut grain 70 years ago. The cradle was a big improvement over the ancient sickle, but even then, most of us would prefer to rock a cradle rather than to swing one. Notice the graceful skill seen commonly 100 years ago. The second harvest was 70 pounds. The tithe of seven pounds was paid by the church to Cleveland Bible College, whose student preacher inspired Perry. Edward Escombe again leads the devotion as an acre of Henry Ford's land was prepared for planting. This time, Leslie Becker prepared the ground. Sam Rice helped Perry fill Leroy Matthews grain drill with 63 pounds of dynamic kernels. Nearly an acre was carefully planted. Later, birds threatened to devour much of the seed. Bad weather threatened the crop. Prospects for a third harvest were very slim. Three hundred persons gathered for the third cutting. It looked like rain, but fortunately the sun came out. Henry Ford surprised Perry by attending the third cutting to see personally what was taking place on his Tecumseh farm. He brought out an old self-rake reaper from his Edison Institute Museum. Harmon Russ, now 93, drove it around the acre field. Mr. Ford, taking a well-worn testament from his pocket, read John 12, verse 24 to some children, remarking, here's the word, there's the wheat. Several men followed the ancient reaper and bound the wheat into sheaves by hand. Before they could finish, a heavy rain came up while most of it was still lying loose on the ground. Mrs. Hayden helps Perry shock the wheat. The following Monday morning after a rainy Sabbath, Perry and Pastor Escombe gathered the rain-soaked and sprouting wheat into shocks and stood them up to dry. The warm weather and moisture were now a threat to the whole third crop. Every kernel of wheat was desperately needed, so Elizabeth Hayden and some children picked up every stray head lying on the water-soaked field. Everything seemed to go wrong with this third crop. Adding to Perry's woes, the annual convention of North American sparrows met that week to feast on dynamic kernels. Alonzo Sisson with a daisy air rifle frightens the birds away. The third crop was almost a failure, but was faithfully tithed. Then, with grateful hearts and faith in God, devotions preceded the planting of the remaining 90% on a 14-acre field of Henry Ford's land. Boys attending the Macon Ford School drove the tractors to prepare the land for the fourth planting. Bushels instead of handfuls of dynamic kernels were then poured into Ford's bright, shiny red wheat drills. The world-famous biblical wheat project was now getting into large-scale production. Prospects were excellent for a bountiful fourth harvest. Mr. Ford was now so enthused over the great tithing experiment that he sent his finest engineers to demonstrate old-time threshing machines from his famous Dearborn Museum. Folks from far and wide came to witness the colorful harvest. Merrill C. Meggs, vice president of the Hearst Corporation, flew in from Chicago with his brother James. Governor Kelly and Charles Figge, commissioner of agriculture, arrived. Henry Ford brought an old reaper which he rode on his father's farm when a boy. Children from the Ford School opened the program with patriotic and religious songs. 
The surging crowd resembled a cross between a county fair and a revival meeting. Governor Kelly brought congratulations from the state of Michigan. Thousands stood out in the hot sun, and WJR broadcasted the program over their Detroit radio station. Dozens of photographers from newspapers, magazines, and newsreels covered the spectacular story of dynamic kernels. Perry and Elizabeth Hayden related some of their trying experiences. One cubic inch of wheat had now grown to nearly a million. Boy Scouts removed the fence around a symbolic plot planted for demonstration. Then the cameramen had a field day. As a squadron of B-24 Army bombers roared overhead, a symbol of the war raging throughout the entire world, they saw Henry Ford, the producer of these instruments of destruction, humbly stoop to harvest with a sickle a few rows of wheat, a symbol of life and peace. Henry Ford II holds the exact sheaf of dynamic kernel's wheat, which is preserved today in the Ford Museum at Greenfield Village near Detroit. A picture is taken of Henry Ford II, Perry Hayden, Henry Ford Sr., and Governor Kelly. The cradling contest included juniors up to 60 years of age, hustlers up to 80, and pioneers above 80. Henry Ford climbed on the old self-rake reaper and drove the horses around the field as happily as he drove the same reaper on his father's farm 70 years before. No wonder Life magazine devoted an entire page to this picture. Rollo Conlon then operated an old buggy rake from Ford's museum. This back-saving device, used during the Civil War days, gathered the loose wheat off the ground to be tied for shocking. The fourth step in this historic pageant of harvesting is a binder invented by Cyrus McCormick in 1831. It revolutionized the cutting of grain. Reverend Bayshore lends a helping hand as neighboring farmers shock the wheat for Perry. The ladies of the Tecumseh Grange are in a gleaning contest. Hurry, hurry, the prize is a set of dishes. Young and old were thrilled as they viewed the pageant covering harvesting progress since Bible days. The Bible says that Gideon was threshing wheat by his father's wine press. Most likely he used a flail like this. How many of you ever saw wheat threshed by horsepower? This is the way it was done in the days before steam engines. Five beautiful teams went around and around as the dust swirled about them. And now let a real man take over. The horse-drawn circular sweep is used to power the Birdsall separator. Henry Ford brought it from his museum in Greenfield Village. Very likely it will never be used again since Mr. Ford's death. The horse-drawn sweeps were replaced by engines like this Westinghouse upright. Henry Ford started this engine with the enthusiasm of a boy with a new toy. The old engine ran as smoothly as the day it was built and kept the men busy feeding the threshing machines. The wheat was fed into many types of separators to illustrate the development of threshing machinery. The golden kernels of biblical wheat poured out and were immediately sacked. A whole inspired community pitched in to do the work. The golden straw silhouetted against the blue sky made a beautiful sight to behold. As Merrill Meggs dipped his hands into the grain, he felt like a farm boy again. Henry Ford walked over to the case engine given to him by his friend Merrill Meggs and joined him on the platform. Mr. Ford, still a mechanical genius, made a few adjustments to get the best performance out of the old engine. He turned on the steam and the old engine, determined to do its best for the occasion, sent the long belt whirling out to the separator. What a day for the movie fan. William Clark of the Case Company, Racine, Wisconsin, was there to see their outmoded equipment still able to do a good day's work. He said, I drove here from Wisconsin,
expecting to see merely a mechanical demonstration of a lot of obsolete equipment. I never dreamed that I was going to witness such a wholesome spirit of community, religious cooperation, and genuine Americanism. The moral value of this project is amazing. Mr. Clark gives Henry Ford II a few pointers on running a separator. Henry Ford had this separator transported hundreds of miles for the occasion. The wheat was sacked as fast as it came from the separators. George Parsons, the local ag teacher, and Ernie Harris, the master of the Tecumseh Grange, challenged Perry to tie a miller's knot. He accepted the challenge and grunted as he lifted the bag over to the pile. Now I'm all in for the day. When the threshing was over, the ground was thoroughly swept to gather every dynamic kernel of wheat. A few interested spectators came on horseback. A miniature engine and separator was made by Henry Ford for his grandchildren, Henry, Benson, Josephine, and William. Using their nicknames, Mr. Ford called it the High Ben Joe Bill. What fun the youngsters had that day with the miniature wagon, tools, and pitchforks. Fred Smith, director of the Edison Institute Museum, empties some gleanings into the small separator. Then Henry Ford II shows a young friend how he played with the toy when he was a boy. I, Ben Joe Bill, was typical of the practical trend of Mr. Ford's mind, even in playthings for the children. Ford the second blows the whistle on the miniature engine as his famous grandfather and Merrill Meggs look on. The morning of the fifth planting, Mr. Ford invited farmers, neighboring ministers, and friends to an appropriate service in the Martha Mary Chapel at Macon near Tecumseh. Henry Ford and Edward Faulkner, author of Plowman's Folly, left the chapel and drove to see the fifth planting. The fourth crop was 379 bushels. After tithing and cleaning seed, there was enough wheat left to replant 230 acres. Mr. Ford ordered the land to be disked instead of plowed under the direction of Mr. Faulkner. Mr. Ford was always willing to pioneer with a new idea that seemed to have genuine merit. Mr. Ford, with the enthusiasm of a boy, encourages Perry. The minister, with raised hand, asked God's blessing on the great tithing demonstration. Fourteen clergymen, Catholic and Protestant, were personally invited by Perry and Mr. Ford for the fifth planting ceremonies. Henry Ford himself marked out 12 rows for planting 360 dynamic kernels as was done originally. Henry Ford, Commissioner Figgy, C.D. Finkbeiner and nine others get 30 kernels each to plant. Faulkner and Ford discuss the planting. Henry Ford fully recognized the spiritual significance of this, his last public undertaking. There is life after death. As a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Then Mr. Ford put on a shoulder bag. Perry filled it with wheat as Mr. Ford said, I haven't done this for over 50 years. Then he said to Perry, you had faith. This thing is going around the world. It was apparent to the old timers that he was joyfully reliving his boyhood days on the farm. Later, Mr. Ford told a friend, when I leave this world, I shall feel that the tithing lesson we taught at Tecumseh will eclipse any of my other accomplishments. Little did Mr. Ford realize that this was his final day in the wheat field and that his last illness was not too far away. Mr. Ford's policy was, anything worth doing at all is worth doing well. A 
Despite warnings by his secretary, Henry Ford spryly climbed up to drive one of his own tractors. Perry got sound advice from Mr. Ford on some phases of the stupendous harvesting problem. The lead tractor started the great battery of drills across the huge 230-acre field. It was an impressive sight, seldom seen in Michigan. All this seed originating from a cubic inch four years before, after four tithes had been paid. Mr. Ford joyfully alight. While having dinner in the Hayden home, Mr. Ford promised to build a mill on the site of the fifth crop. Construction had begun. The mill, started that summer, stands today and will stand for years to come, a working monument to the man of faith who backed the project. By the mill is a beautiful mill pond. Wheat in Michigan is planted in the fall. A heavy snow gives it a protecting blanket, assuring a good harvest. The fifth crop is ready to be harvested. The new mill is ready to grind the biblical wheat. The miller's home formerly belonged to Perry's grandfather, Meade. Mr. Ford had always wanted to build a little mill with a water wheel. Perry Hayden's project was just the inspiration to make his boyhood dreams come true. In addition to the water wheel, an auxiliary engine was installed from the old Comfort Tile Yard, used by Elizabeth Hayden's grandfather. Many notables came for the fifth token harvest, held in the Friends Church and Yard. Coach Yost of Michigan may be seen visiting with Don Falkenberg of Columbus, Ohio. Perry leaves the church to direct the token cutting. Leland Brighton, a farmer of the Catholic faith, cuts the tiny plot of wheat. Carrying out the idea of the 12, there were 12 representatives from the Grange, the Supervisors, the 4-H clubs, and the churches of Lenawee County. As was done at the first cutting, each placed his bundle into the common shock. Senator Elmer Porter tied the shock, and the wheat was later sent to army chaplains all over the world by the Bible Meditation League. Six miles away, the 230 acres of wheat was ready for the actual harvest. A crew of 67 workmen with 40 Alice Chalmers harvesters rushed through one of the most spectacular harvesting jobs ever seen east of the Mississippi. A tragic thing happened at this time. Mr. Ford was stricken while in Georgia. His personal hobbies and interests were left in a state of confusion and uncertainty. No one cared to assume the responsibility for completing his great plans for the tithing project. The vast Ford farms were to be sold. This left Perry without the necessary land to complete the demonstration. The whole world awaited the results of the harvest. Reporters and cameramen swarmed to Tecumseh. Perry was desperate. The only place he could look was up. The Tecumseh Grange volunteered to sack the fifth crop after it had been hauled to one of Ford's barns. As commanded in the book of Leviticus, Perry felt commissioned to sow wheat for six years and to rest the seventh. The fifth crop amounted to 5,555 bushels. After the tithe had been paid, this still left 5,000 bushels, requiring several thousand acres of land. Where could he get that much land? In answer to prayer, 276 farmers of 30 faiths and creeds, Catholic and Protestant, came to Perry and offered the necessary land to complete the final and sixth planting. Here is the fifth tithe, amounting to 555 bushels of golden grain. Valued at $860, it was sold, the money paid to the church, which in turn gave it to the Tecumseh Hospital. 
The 5,000 bushels of wheat seed were stored in an abandoned depot. Farmers called for it there. Despite skeptics who prophesied failure, enough land was offered to care for the entire 5,000 bushels. By truck, auto, and trailer, farmers from 175 different churches willingly took the wheat to plant, harvest, and tithe. Instead of one man completing the project, 276 God-fearing farmers took on the big task. A seaman tiller pulverized the eight-acre infield in the center of the racetrack at the Lanawi County Fairgrounds in Adrian, Michigan for the sixth harvest ceremonies. World War II was over, but peoples were now looking to America for wheat. The sixth and final harvest of dynamic kernels would save thousands from starving. Thursday, August 1st, was proclaimed Biblical Wheat Day by Governor Kelly. The American Legion Drum Corps headed a huge parade in the form of a cross, led by the Jewish commander, Frank Kessler. Now the sickle, cradle, reaper, and binder followed each other in close succession as crowds lined the streets in Adrian, leading to the fairgrounds. Banners, posters, and gaily decorated windows all added to the spirit of the great occasion. The fifth advance in wheat harvesting was the modern combine. But just as the sixth crop of wheat was the largest, so now we have the sixth step in wheat harvesting machinery, a McCormick Deering self-propelled combine. As farmers brought in their tithes of dynamic kernels to be sent to Europe for relief, the spirit of the occasion could be felt everywhere. It was an outpouring of the soul of America as the big hearts of her people and their faith in God were publicly demonstrated in a united effort of all races, creeds, and nationalities. Model T trucks with their tithes of wheat followed more modern trucks. How happy these farmers are now, bringing in the tithe. last group in the parade was a party of gaily dressed men and women on their ponies from the Flying W Ranch. Amid flying colors, music filling the air, and joyful enthusiasm of the crowds, cars loaded with threshing machinery moved through town to the fairground. Cars with their tithes of wheat were routed past a checking tent and then directed to the mountain of wheat which grew larger and larger throughout the day. Thousands of bags were unloaded from every kind of conveyance which could bring the wheat into town for this great celebration. Men, women, boys and girls all pitched in to help with the unloading as cars kept coming in an endless stream. By noon, the grandstands and bleacher seats were filled, and thousands of people were milling around among the exhibits and demonstrations on the field. Between 10 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night, it was estimated that 15,000 people visited the final harvest ceremony. Mrs. Charles Kalman, author of Streams in the Desert, was there with Mary Jane Hayden. And these Girl Scouts did a grand job helping wherever they were asked. As the self-propelled combine harvests the final crop of the Lord's wheat, we think back just five summers before when a little sickle cut the first crop. Now the crop required 2,666 acres. <laughs> if these boys had to work that hard at home, wouldn't it be awful? As the boys pass one of the Hayden Mills huge Fruhoff trailers, Mr. Harvey Fruhoff tells what giving means to him personally. This great tithing experiment demonstrates a great truth which I have practiced all my life. That is, the more I have given of myself, my time and money, 
the more I have been rewarded. Nothing bears so great a harvest as a kind deed or a generous act. A big Longfellow Port Huron engine drove the Port Huron separator to thresh some of the wheat. What boy from a small town has not thrilled as these picturesque engines chug through town? A tractor was rigged up in the field to drive an old-fashioned stone mill. The first wheat threshed was ground on stone in the field where grown. These old stone mills were used right up to the invention of the steel rolls in the 1870s. Perry informs the crowd over a loudspeaker that some whole wheat flour will be flown by helicopter to Toledo, Ohio to be made into graham crackers by the Lakeside Biscuit Company. This army helicopter was brought from Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio by Major Dale Jensen and Major Ernest Castle. The only time in all history wheat was cut, threshed, milled, flown, baked and eaten all in the same afternoon. It's on its way. Dr. Walter A. Meyer of the Lutheran Hour speaks briefly from a platform of dynamic kernels. Michigan's colorful new governor, Kim Siegler, responds. Perry also takes a bow. The helicopter sails in over the treetops with 14,000 crispy graham crackers and then gracefully settles in the center of the field to feed the multitudes. It is a race to see who gets the first cracker. It looks as if Perry won. The crowd quickly grabbed them for souvenirs. Clarence Pickett accepts the wheat for overseas relief. William Danforth of Purina Mills agrees to process the wheat into a relief cereal and ship abroad immediately. Edgar Guest Jr. of Detroit introduces Mrs. Emma Clarissa Clement, American mother of 1946. She is interviewed by Perry. We want to know something about this marvelous family of yours. Uh, Mrs. Abby Clement Jackson, who is a the Executive Secretary of the Women's Home and Foreign Missionary Society of the United States, the Virgin Islands, and Africa. Rufus, who is the President of Atlanta University. James, uh, I don't mean James, Fred, who uh, is the Professor of Physics at West Virginia State College. George, who is the American Red Cross at uh, Italy. Now, Ruth, who is the wife of Dr. J. Max Bond, who is a coordinator between the Haitian and the American government at Port-au-Prince, Haiti. James, who has just returned as a major from the army, now in the pastorate at Rush Memorial Church, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Emma Mills, who is professor of English at Atlanta University. And then you really think it does pay to tithe? I certainly do, because I don't believe I would have been able to accomplish what I have with the children if I had not first tithed myself and then taught them to do likewise. Thank you, that's wonderful. <laughs> and now, folks, I want you to meet personally Mr. C.D. Finkbeiner, the farmer from Saline, Michigan, who gave us the original cubic inch of seed. C.D., now that it's all over, what do you think about it? I've gotten more enjoyment out of giving this cubic inch of wheat than I have out of selling hundreds of bushels of certified seed. And I'm only sorry now that I didn't give you 10 bushels. <laughs> Start with it. <laughs> See, it's a good thing you didn't give us 10 bushels. You know why? No. Well, 10 bushels of seed at the same rate would have amounted to 1,505,000,000 bushels of wheat in six years' time. <laughs> this wheat was grown under the same conditions as any other wheat in the locality. That's right. We had smut and rust and birds and drought and hail and the whole thing. And yet, it just came through wonderfully. How do you really account for the success of it in spite of all of those? I'm sure the Lord's blessing was in it from the start. In checking over the 276 different contracts of farmers who agreed to plant and tie the last year of dynamic kernels, I ran across the name of Floyd A. Jacob of Manchester, Michigan, who's here. Uh, Floyd, how did you happen to be the number one contract here in this in this whole list? Living near the Kamsi, I watched this project with a great deal of interest. 
And when the seed was offered to farmers, my family and I decided to plant and tie some of this wheat. Well, Floyd, I'm awfully glad you did. And what did your total uh, tithe amount to? About 300 bushel. Well, that's wonderful. And they uh, gave about $60 for the church. Well, what's the, what do you think this meant to our community as you saw it? Well, I think it brought the churches of all denominations close together in a great Christian project. Well, I'm sure it did. And as far as you're concerned personally and other farmers, what do you, how do you think it applies to them? I think God will bless all farmers who will tithe their crops. All through the day, the wheat continued to pour in. The final figures showed that the sixth and final harvest yielded 72,150 bushels of wheat, worth nearly $150,000, all from an original cubic inch of wheat six years before. As we view the mountain of wheat built by God-fearing men, while the atomic bomb hangs over our heads, we realize that only by making God our landlord, as taught by this biblical lesson, so well demonstrated here, can we save the world from total destruction. Thus, the curtain went down on a six-year demonstration which made the Bible a living reality.